With us today is Anna Lemke. She has written the book, Dopamine Nation, Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence. It is a, an absolutely terrific book. It is my favorite book that I've read probably in the last 12 months for sure, uh, and maybe even longer. It feels like a really, really important book to read, to give people to think about because it is both interesting, it's fun to read, and, and so um, uh, profound in terms of the observations and insights about how we live our lives and why we do the things that we do and how to actually change the things that we wanna change. Anna is a professor of psychiatry and addiction medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine. She's chief of the Stanford Addiction Medicine Dual Diagnosis Clinic. Uh, and we are super fortunate. I've been very, very excited to have this conversation. Anna, welcome to the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So let's start with some basic foundation definitions, right? What is addiction? Because this is where you focus your time and your energy. And, you know, is it just the person with needle marks on the floor in the street on the ground? Or, you know, am I addicted to sugar? So addiction is the continued compulsive use of a substance or behavior despite harm to self and or others. That's sort of like the broadest definition that you could have. If we were going to break it down into component parts, um, you can think about the four C's, control, compulsions, consequences, and cravings. Control means using more than I plan to. Compulsions means a level of automaticity to my use. So I find myself using even when I plan not to. Mm -hmm. um, consequences is sort of like the sine qua non of addiction where we have health consequences, relationship consequences, work consequences, you name it. And yet despite those serious consequences, uh, we continue to struggle uh, with using or with stopping use. And then finally, cravings. Cravings can be intrusive thoughts. Cravings can also be physiologic responses, sometimes experienced as sweating, stomach cramping, but it's that sudden overwhelming urge to use our drug of choice. There are also um, physio... Oh, sorry, I'm going no, on. No, 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 no. I was just going to say two, two important physiologic parameters of addiction, um, which are again, speak to the neuroadaptive changes, our tolerance, needing more of the drug over time to get the same effect or finding that the drug just stops working at a given dose. And then withdrawal, when we stop using, we go into a, a withdrawal phenomenon characterized by both psychological and physical symptoms. So what I'm curious about is, is it subjective or objective? So maybe other people might not look and go, well, Peter, you're overeating sugar. You have no control over yourself. You're but I, I see, I mean, and they might, they might mm -hmm. objectively look yeah. at that or they might not. And I might subjectively, and the consequence might be my own self-judgment, right? You know, like, and, and I'm just thinking about people who are high achieving and might be perfectionist and are, the, are, is the bar for addiction a subjective bar or is it an objective bar? It's a great question. So there are no brain scans or blood tests to diagnose addiction. We base the diagnosis on phenomenology which is how we diagnose all mental disorders. That means we base it on patterns of behavior that have been seen across different demographics, across generations, um, across geographic regions. And they're sort of, they're robust kinds of patterns. So I think it's fair to say that we would agree that probably since the beginning of human history, there have been people who have not been able to consume certain intoxicants um, in moderation. It's just, it, it's a thing, but you're, you're absolutely right. Like sometimes people with very severe signs and symptoms of addiction will disavow that they have that problem. Sometimes people with very moderate symptoms of compulsive abuse might conceptualize their use as very problematic. It is a spectrum disorder and the individual's subjective interpretation of their behavior um, might or might not align with what, what somebody outside uh, thinks about. Might think. I would say, yeah, might think. Yeah. I would think though that in general, you know, if you feel like you have a verklempt relationship with some kind of drug or some kind of behavior, that's, I mean, you know, that's, I would validate that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't invalidate your personal sugar experience, experience. for example, right. just because I can't tell by looking at you that you, you have that problem. I think one of the 
most amazing things, you know, about being a psychiatrist is that we actually get to look under the hood right. and the vast majority of people that I see, you would never be able to tell just by looking at them that they have, you know, uh, you know, serious psychological problems or behavioral problems. Yeah. All right. Um, so, so one more question about addiction, and then I want to go to dopamine, yeah. which is, I don't know if you know Judd Brewer. Do you know Judd Brewer? He's, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's an academic, uh, uh, psychi psychologist, uh, um, out of Brown, but, but anyway, he's been writing a lot, uh, about, he's written a lot about anxiety and he's written a lot about, um, cigarette, helping people stop mm -hmm. smoking cigarettes and sugar. He's been on this podcast. I like him a lot. He's a great guy. Um, so what he says was, one of the things that he said is sugar um, may be considered to be more addictive than cocaine, for example, because when they give, you know, mice or rats a pile of cocaine and a pile of sugar, they'll go to the sugar and they'll leave the cocaine. Does that, where does that fit in to your understanding of addiction? And is that something you can say, like, this is more addictive than that kind of thing? Mm, great question and, and great example. So addiction, like all mental illnesses, but maybe even more so for addiction, is what we call a biopsychosocial disease. So there's a biological component, a psychological component, and then a sociological component having to do with the external environment. So when we think about one substance or behavior being less or more addictive than another substance behavior, we cannot do that in a vacuum, meaning that we must take into account the sociological context, the environment, and also the enormous inter-individual variability that people have in terms of their propensity for liking certain types of drugs. Right. So let's, let's talk about sugar versus cocaine, which is the example that, that you gave. You know, there, you, there are certain types of mice that you can breed for whom their drug of choice will absolutely be sugar and they will preferentially prefer sugar. And in the human population, we all vary in terms of what, you know, appeals to us. For some people, sugar is the drug. No, it's, and, it's, it's like I, I can drink a glass of wine or what, like I have no, right. there's no addictive element right. to alcohol for me at all. Yeah. But I'm amazed that when people bring a dessert out to the table, everybody else doesn't completely finish theirs. Like, I just don't understand how, like, yeah, which yeah. is more for me to finish, but yeah, I get to yeah. finish theirs also. But I don't understand, like, yeah. what that is. So that's just biologically and maybe yes. psychologically, like maybe, you know, sugar and sweets means something to me in a way that it and will that now we're going to link over to dopamine. If that's happening, is it doing something to my dopamine? Is my is, is is it creating a dopamine response in me that is different than my wife's response, who you know can have a spoonful full of sugar and then stop? Yes. So before before we move on to that, well, just the quick answer is yes. Yeah. That's exactly what it means um, that that you are addicted to sugar or that you have propensity of vulnerability to sugar addiction is that you, when you have sugar it releases a lot of dopamine at once in the part of the brain called the reward pathway. Whereas if you were to use some other drug, it, it, it might not release much dopamine at all. But let me just get quickly back to this, again, this biopsychosocial model, because I think it's really important. Um, and it speaks to the, the broader problem of the modern world. I too used to believe that I was immune to the problem of addiction. Sugar is not really that all that appealing to me. You know, your standard drugs, nicotine, alcohol, cannabis, caffeine, no interest. But for me, it's, you know, love, attachment, and ultimately what I became addicted to, which was romance novels progressing to erotica over time, which I got access to through the internet. The point being that our world has substantially changed such that there's increased access to a much broader variety of intoxicants than ever before. And things that normally we consider adaptive, like making human connections, has now become drugified through things like social media, um, which gets to the other, in the sociological piece, um, is that simple access is one of the biggest risk factors for becoming addicted. If you live in a place or an environment where you have easy access to your drug of choice, you're more likely to do it and more likely to get addicted to it, which is why in a way, sugar is actually a harder drug to, to be than cocaine because cocaine is illegal and you have right. to make quite a lot of effort to go out and get it. 
Right. You cannot find a piece of bread that doesn't have sugar in it, right? right? So let me ask you, Anna, we're going to have to talk for hours. I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to do sorry. coffee podcasts or no, no, it's not for you to be sorry at all. You're so interesting. And there's so much, I have so many questions around this that, that we'll, 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 uh, we'll figure it out. We might have to have offline <laughs> conversations if you're willing. Um, yes, that's fine. What I'm curious about sociologically hmm. is are we living in a time when we are all more prone to falling into our addiction of choice, not simply because access is so easy to so many addictive things, but because we are living in a time where some of the basic social uh, fulfillment, some of the basic things that normally would fulfill us, the kinds of relationships that we would normally have, the kinds of, you know, the, the amount that we work versus having, mm -hmm having, you know, uh, 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 I guess I keep going back to deep connection because I think that's an important part, that, that those things are lacking. And so this combination of, um, of a lack of fulfillment in things that are more nurturing and access to things that are less nurturing but addictive is creating more of a sort of dopamine epidemic. Yeah, so you've hit on one of the fundamental messages that I'm trying to convey in Dopamine Nation, it's a tricky one. It's It has to do fundamentally with this idea of demand uh, versus supply. And generally in the psychological literature to date, we've all been looking for, well, what is the reason that people get addicted, right? There must be some impoverishment of their primary relationships. There must be some kind of trauma that they're trying to correct. Um, th there must be, you know, some kind of just deep, uh, maybe biochemical problem that they're trying to address. And, 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 and that, that goes into the demand bucket of why people become addicted, right? And there's absolutely truth to all of those things. But what I'm suggesting in Dopamine Nation, which I think is something that we don't really recognize, is the extent to which you can have all of those things, all of those boxes checked, wonderful relationships, meaningful work, uh, plenty of leisure time for creativity, no financial worries, blah, blah, blah. And you can still get addicted right. because, because our fundamental wiring over millions of years of evolution has us approaching pleasure and avoiding pain. It's reflexive. We cannot do otherwise. And now we live in this world where everything has become a drug. So you don't need to have those kinds of reasons to become addicted. And more importantly, when we become addicted, we become more isolated. When we become addicted, our, the rest of our lives are less fulfilling. And so it can be very hard to see true cause and effect, right? Because once we're in our addiction, we, like I did, my, let me just use myself as an example. I became sort of dissatisfied with my husband. I wasn't that interested in spending time with my kids. Even my work, which had long been you know, a source of interest and reward became you know, less interesting to me. And it wasn't until I recognized that my brain had essentially been hijacked by this addictive process that made those aspects of my life less interesting. And then I got out of that vortex and then all of a sudden those things became rich again. So I, that, that's, I guess that's how I would answer that. And, and when you're saying that we, that, that um, addictive substances are more, uh, that, that there's more propensity towards addictive substances now than there was, you know, whatever, 30 years ago, that's because of access. That's because we could flip through Facebook or we could eat as much sugar as we want or sugars put in everything or, right. you know, we, there's like, there's no limitation to porns all over the internet. Like people right. can, do whatever, right? Got it. I, I okay. basically break it down to four four things. It's 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 access, quantity, potency, and novelty. All those things have changed because people will say to me, "Well, there have always been intoxicants." I'm like, "No, it's different now." Say that There's list again. Availability, access, access? Ac availability, or access. access. We now have twenty four seven through our right. smartphones, right? Quantity. So quantity is really important to the risk of becoming addicted. If you have a natural stopping point such that you just can't do it for a while till you get the next batch, 
that is often key to making sure that you reset reward pathways so that you don't get into this spiral of addictive overuse. But I mean, TikTok is infinite, right? We, right. It doesn't run out. And a right. lot of other things are so accessible that they effectively don't run out. Right. Then you've got potency. So what does potency mean? Potency is a way to overcome tolerance. When the drug stops working, we get a more potent form. One of the best ways to make a drug more potent is to combine it with another drug. People have known that forever. You combine opioids and benzos. Um, on, on, you know, on the internet, you know, people can combine, combine beautiful faces with gamified rewards, uh, with music, with narrative, you know, right. there's lots of ways to make that more potent. And then finally, it's the variety or novelty because dopamine is very sensitive to novelty, but also the wide array of drugs means that we're all going to find our drug of choice eventually, right? It's coming soon to a website near you. And before you know it, you're going to be off and running. Great. So say the not great, but great. So say the <laughs> say the four four things again that qualify something as an addiction. Because as you and listeners, as you're listening, I want you to think about these four things. And now for the rest of the conversation that Anna and I are going to have, we're going to unpack this, like what's happening with the dopamine, and then also what you do about it. Yeah. Um, and and so I want you to have in mind, like as you listen to these four things, think about something in your life that might qualify or your kids might qualify for this. So what are those four things again? So these are the four things that that increase the addictive potential of something. It's, no, it's that, access. That would, no, 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 that would qualify something as an addiction, meaning you're thinking about, you know, compulsive. Uh, oh, oh control, that those four things. Those oh, right, right. Things. So yeah, yeah. so control, control, compulsions consequences and craving. Okay. As well as tolerance and withdrawal. And you're, you're, you increase your tolerance and you have withdrawal when you don't, when you don't get it. That's right. Okay. So think about these things and we've mentioned a whole bunch of them. Okay. So Anna, please share with us now, like the dopamine pain balance dynamic, like how that's all working. Okay, great. Like what's going so, on in our brains. Right. So, so our brains have evolved over millions of years to approach pleasure and avoid pain. One of the most interesting findings in neuroscience in the last hundred years is that the way that our brain processes pleasure and pain is like opposite sides of a balance and that pleasure and pain are co-located. So the same parts of the bra brain that process pleasure also process pain. So imagine that in your brain, the part called the, the reward pathway, there's a balance. It's like a board on a fulcrum. It's kind of like a teeter-totter in a kid's playground. When we do something pleasurable, that balance tilts one way. If we experience pain, the balance tilts the other. One of the overarching rules governing this balance is that it wants to remain level. It doesn't want to be deviated for very long to the side of pleasure or pain. And our brains will work very hard to restore a level balance or what neuroscientists call homeostasis. So let me interrupt you here for a sec. So when I think of what I know about Buddhism, right? Yeah. And when I think about this, you know, thing that's written a lot about, which is, you know, you don't you don't go for desire and you also mm. don't go for repulsion. Like you're mm -hmm. trying to not, and I've always felt a little bit like, well, but isn't life, you know, rich because we long for things and, and, you know, we try to stay away from things. But what you're saying is that, that, that longing for something and that avoidance of something that, you know, craving and and I don't know what the Buddhist word, I can't remember the word that that we use in Buddhism a lot or that people use in Buddhism for this, but you know, the the sort of avoidance that um that Buddhism is onto something here, which oh, is to say oh, is yeah. a really level. Mm, oh yeah. So so a couple of things. First of all, of course we need desire. You know, desire is what makes us human. There's a very famous experiment where scientists engineered a rat to have no dopamine transmission. Dopamine is our pleasure and reward neurotransmitter. And what they discovered is when they put food in that rat's mouth, it would eat the food and swallow it and seem to get some pleasure from it. But when they put the food even a body length away, the rat starved to death because it couldn't be bothered to get up and go get the food. So dopamine wow. is absolutely fundamental to life, right? We have to desire. Um, and of course, these ideas about, you know, moderation and the relationship between pleasure and pain, um, they're, in, you know, integral to Buddhist practice. Socrates and Plato wrote about them. Any major theological text will allude to this kind of phenomenon after darkness comes the dawn. But what, what to me, what's so fascinating and salient about neuroscientific findings 
is the neurobiological mechanism and the cost to pleasure. And this is why I don't, I don't think that Buddhism talks about this, or although I may, I may be wrong because I'm, I'm, I'm not a student of Buddhism, but what, what, you know, remember this pleasure pain balance, there's this drive to restore homeostasis. How does the brain do that? The brain does that by tipping the balance an equal and opposite amount to whatever the initial stimulus was. So if I eat a piece of chocolate, I get a little release of dopamine in my reward pathway and my balance tips to the side of pleasure. To restore a level balance, my brain tilts it not just to the level position, but actually to the pain position. That's that moment of wanting one more piece of chocolate before going back to the level position. And I always imagine this as these neuroadaptation gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance to bring it level again, but they like it up there. So they stay on until it's tipped an equal amount, amount to the side of pain. So and this that, is really, really important. So yeah. when I eat chocolate or yes. when somebody goes through TikTok or, right. um, and, and, I, and I have like, we'll just use chocolate. I'll eat a little piece of chocolate. It's not that I have pleasure and then I go back to balance. It's that I have pleasure and then I go past balance to pain. Yes, that is the key. And it often occurs outside of conscious awareness in small ways throughout the day. Of course, if we get wildly drunk, we have a hangover. That's an obvious case, right? Or if we have exposed to opioids, we have opioid withdrawal. But really what's happening now is that we're bombarding our reward pathway with these pleasurable behaviors and experiences on our phone, in you know what we drink, what we eat all day long. And outside of conscious awareness, unless we are paying attention to it, we are getting these kinds of crashes, right, to the side of pain. And that's a physiologic cost. The definition of stress is any deviation from homeostasis. When this balance has to work to restore homeostasis, it actually elicits a cortisol response. It is the definition of stress, which is a great irony because we often use intoxicants to manage our stress, but actually it's the intoxicant that creates the physiologic well, stress. You, you have this beautiful quote and I bolded it in my notes. The reason we're all so miserable may be because we're working so hard to avoid being miserable. Right, right. And that gets at the second major rule of this balance, which is that with repeated exposures to the same or similar pleasurable stimulus, that initial bump gets shorter and weaker, but that after effect gets stronger and longer. In other words, oh, those gremlins start to multiply, right? So if I use a drug again and again over days to weeks to months to years, I end up with enough gremlins on the pain side of my balance to fill this whole room. And now they're camped out there. They're not going anywhere soon. So when I'm not using my drug, I'm experiencing the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any- So at this substance. point, after, you know, a pint of, ben, you know, like a couple of spoonfuls of Ben and Jerry's right. and you're fine. A pint of Ben and Jerry's every night and it's, it, you're, you're, first of all, your tolerance, I guess, is going up. Right. And your and and it's and even well, sorry I should say it the other way, that same spoonful of Ben and Jerry's is creating increasingly more pain, the more I'm regularly doing it or eating it. Exactly, what it's doing is it's resetting your reward threshold so that instead of having a supple balance that comes back to this level position you're walking around with a balance that's tilted to the side of pain. Right. And this can, this can endure for a really long time, even after you stop using your drug, which is why people with addiction will relapse even when their lives are objectively better. It's because they are experiencing these universal symptoms of withdrawal from, from any addictive substance, which again are primarily psychological, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, depression, and craving. Right. Um, okay. So, uh, so for those of us who like drama, this is bad news, right? <laughs> like for those of us that like the excitement mm -hmm. and that like, you know, like if, if, if there's like you're, you're, you have a very strong vote towards moderation with a very high cost for those moments of excitement, whether that's, yeah. you know, in whatever way that is, mm -hmm. that those moment of excitement come along, you know, with, with an expansion comes a contraction. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, the more you tolerate, you know, the more you experience that expansion, the bigger the contraction. 
Yes, but I would qualify that by saying that I'm not advocating for people to have boring lives. What I'm saying is that Actually, I'm a person who needs a certain degree of intensity in my life, and we, we all mm-hmm. vary with that, right. but that there are better ways to get your intensity, and it's by actually cr- creating friction or getting your dopamine indirectly by doing things that are hard. So it's not for, I'm not advocating the, a boring life where we don't right, have right. any, I'm advocating that. An effortful, know, an effortful yeah. life, right? That's that right. makes so much sense. Like where the, like, like writing which is incredibly pleasurable, but also incredibly hard. It is both painful and pleasurable. Yes. So looking for those experiences that are both painful and pleasurable. Yeah, and learning to tolerate the ambiguity and the uncertainty um, of where, you know, it it all is going to go. It's kind of a leap of faith that in the long term, it will all have been worth it. so one of the things that I've noticed is, you know, even in, in my industry is there's lots of people who are very successful and, and they keep pushing to be more and more and more successful or more right. money, more books that are bestsellers, more of this, more of that. And I've thought a lot about that over the last couple of years. And, and I wonder whether that's, that's explained by the same thing, which is, yeah, you know, or even when people have a number, like I need a million dollars in my bank account when they get a million. Well, now I need $2 million. You know, like the number keeps going up. And Mm -hmm. is, is, is that explained? Like is dopamine, not just an, uh, a momentary thing, but it could be a light, you know, like, like there's the, the success that you get, I guess it's still momentary when you get that first amount of money, that's, you know, interesting and exciting and et cetera, but then you, you're still craving whatever you originally craved. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I, I always kind of come back to sort of like having compassion for ourselves because again, we're wired to do, we're, 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 we've evolved to be strivers, right? We're wired to chase down dopamine. But what we need to recognize is that we can get caught in an addictive vortex around that pursuit that ultimately really can be very self and other destructive. And achievement, you know, a sort of a sar- narcissistic self aggrandizement, which is not to say that everybody who strives to achieve is a narcissist. We have a, a degree of healthy narcissism that we invest in things that allows us to you know, do whatever we do, but it's very important to recognize the ways in ways in which our society and our culture has, has almost adulterated what is basically a healthy striving impulse and, uh, and drugified it, you know, by all the ways that we lavish attention on people who are rich and famous and successful, um, the ways that we enumerate things by, you know, ranking ourselves compared to others or, you know, the, the millions of ways in which we count ourselves now, all of which is very vulnerable to kind of that dopamine chasing. Um, and it's, you know, it's, we're circling the drain once we're doing right. that. Once, once right. we've lost sort of the process and the deeper meaning of why we do something, you know, even if it's just to be in our, our the flow, th- th- it becomes adulterated. And then, then it's something different Then it becomes sort of like a monster and we're kind of caught up in it. Right. Um, okay. So, so many more things to talk about, but I want to mm-hmm. shift to what now? So now mm-hmm. we, we, you know, like, so, so we recognize it, we see it, it's all over the place. It's unavoidable. And certainly like there are entire industries that are built around getting us addicted. Like certainly technology we know about everything from Doritos, you know, everything to like, uh, I don't know. I, I saw Dope Sick on Hulu uh, mm-hmm. recently, and it's you know the opioid crisis, and and food that's manufactured to be addictive, and right. technology that's manufactured that's created to be addictive. Like all these things that are, um, and 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 marketing that's that's you know, and and a society that's you know right. I that's created to be addictive. So what do we do? Help us out of this conundrum as we continue to live in a society that reinforces it. Yeah. So, I mean, what I prescribe is really what I learned to prescribe to my patients over the years who are struggling with more traditional addictions to things like nicotine, cannabis, alcohol, 
which is that it should start with a period of abstinence long enough for those neuroadaptation gremlins to hop off and for uh, that, those reward pathways to reset themselves. So uh, for example, we're, we're always firing dopamine at a baseline level. What happens when with addiction is that eventually to compensate for all the stimulus that we're getting, we end up firing dopamine at, at a lower level, right? We get in this dopamine deficit state. So we need to abstain from our drug of choice for long enough to tell our bodies, oh, it's time to start to upregulate dopamine again and to bring in that back up to baseline levels. Why is that important? Number one, because in resetting or realigning healthy dopamine firing, we are more able to take joy in other more modest pleasures. And we're not constantly craving our drug because that state of craving is really all consuming. Um, so, also, so but, but I'll just want to say there's, I want to interrupt for a second. There's something important here, which is for people, like when I think about, okay, so how long should I not eat sugar for it? Let's say a month, right? That's yes. what you suggest. Okay. Yes. So um, one of the things that helps me do that is knowing Okay, so I, I can't eat sugar for a month to reset, but what that means, the hope in that is yeah. that the it's not that I'm giving up the pleasure I get from sugar because I will, when I give up sugar, start to get more pleasure from things I don't get as much pleasure from now. Great conceptualization and really at the heart of it because we so often think of this task of, giving up the things we like to do as depriving ourselves, but really we're giving ourselves a great, great gift because in doing so, we're really recalibrating reward pathways such that we'll be more resilient in the face of pain and more able to enjoy pleasure, including in many instances, going back to our drug of choice, you know, in your case, sugar, and being able to eat a slice of orange and just be overwhelmed by the sweetness of it which right. when we're eating chocolate cake every day, you know, an orange is, isn't really going to do the trick. Right. So, uh, but, but, but it's key to realize that in those first couple of weeks of stopping our drug of choice, we will be in withdrawal. And the craving is really enormous along with, again, irritability, anxiety, insomnia. But if we can just get through those first two weeks, we can get to that, those 30 days and we've reset reward pathways. We can enjoy um, maybe enjoy our drug of choice again in more modest quantities. We can enjoy, enjoy other things. And also very importantly, and this is something that I learned over decades of treating patients with addiction, it's only when we get some distance from our drug of choice that we can look back and see true cause and effect. When we're chasing dopamine, we don't really see the impact that it has. It's only when, when we get away from it, we look back and go, wow, I've had so many patients say, wow, when I look back, it seems surreal what I was doing. I can't believe I was doing those things. I was so caught up in it. So that's really key. And what about like, for example, you hear with alcohol or certainly Alcoholics Anonymous where you're always an alcoholic mm -hmm. and you can never, you know, like uh, a, a drop of alcohol will, will set you back. Do you, well, is, is, but you, I'm sort of curious your view on that. Yeah. With other so, things too, alcohol mm -hmm. and other things. Yeah, so I have seen um, I have seen patients who have been able to have met criteria for alcohol addiction, alcohol use disorder, or alcoholism, and who have been able after a period of absence to go back to using in moderation with a lot of effort. And I've seen patients who have been unable to do that. They have something called the abstinence violation effect. As soon as they go back to using, their, they binge. They're on a bender. Um, so it really depends on the person and other factors in their lives and how diligent they are about creating those self-finding strategies, strategies that allow for moderation. I will say though, that the discussion around moderation is really, really important today because there are increasingly drugs that we can't eliminate altogether. For example, technology, right? We have to learn how to moderate that because you can't participate in the modern world, practically speaking, without inter interfacing with these devices. Food is another great example. We can't not eat, right? So we have to figure out how to navigate modern food. Uh, sex, most people would think that, you know, a healthy sex is an important part of, uh, you know, a thriving life. So how do we moderate that for people who have sex addiction? Right. And, and, and the way to moderate that? Well, I mean, what I essentially talk about is it begins with a period of abstinence to reset reward pathways. People often say, well, can't I just decrease my use? And I, what I say is in my experience, it's much, much harder to go from using a lot to using a little than it is to go from using a lot to using none to reintroducing a little. So that what is that much means more for, 
TikTok is don't use your iPhone for a month or don't use TikTok for a month or how do you how do you do it or with sugar like right yeah so you, it, how, it depends on the person you kind of talk right. through it you think through if you're doing this project with yourself you think through it um, you know for example I had a, a young man addicted to video games and that was his drug of choice so it was like okay I'm not going to have any video games for a month but then he realized you know what if I go on YouTube at all, I'm going to watch people playing video games. That's going to be a trigger for me to want to play video games. I'm right. not going to be able to make it. So he had to eliminate that too. So you have to figure out, you know, what are, what, what's your drug of choice? And then what are the other things that would trip you into using that you need to eliminate? It's interesting. In Judaism, it's called a geder, which is like, uh -huh. if you, you're not allowed to eat milk with meat, it uh -huh. says you're not allowed to cook a calf in its mother's milk, but chicken is considered part of that. And the question is why? Because you can't possibly cook a chicken in its mother's milk. Yeah. But it's because if you start eating chicken, then yeah. you'll probably end up eating veal. And they look yeah. a lot alike. And they, <laughs> so you put a fence around it. That's right. And you say, you know, a yeah. demilitarized zone. Right. And you go, I know this is the thing I'm not supposed to do, yes. but I'm not going to do all this other stuff because, yeah. you know. Um, yeah. Okay, exactly. so so um, you also talk, and I found this fascinating. So maybe share with my audience why I am finishing all of my hot showers with cold ones now. Oh, are you really good for you? I, I am, the, and it's great. The double, actually, the, go good. It's the double super seven shower. Super painful. It's super <laughs> painful. I mean, it's really painful. It's all I could do to count to ten and try to keep breathing, but for the next hour or two, I feel awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, that's great. I'm glad you're doing that. So remember the balance, right? When we, when the initial stimulus is pleasure, the counter effect is pain with repeated pleasure. We end up stuck over on pain. So what if the initial stimulus is pain? Those gremlins will hop on the pleasure side and we will get this little period of pleasure in response. So we'll get dopamine essentially, but we'll get it indirectly. Why? Because when we're telling our body that we're being injured by a mild to moderate noxious stimuli, not a, not a serious, uh, you know, dangerous stimulus, then we're telling the body, okay, I've got to compensate for that by upregulating my own production of endogenous feel-good hormones and neurotransmitters like dopamine, like norepinephrine, like serotonin. And this has been studied. And so for example, when people are immersed in an ice cold water bath for an hour, there is a slow and gradual increase in dopamine levels over the period of immersion, which is sustained for hours afterwards. Now contrast that to an intoxicant where you get a sudden bolus or release in the reward pathway, followed by plummeting levels of dopamine, not just to baseline, but below baseline before this restoration, a very different type of trajectory. So a much better way to get your dopamine is indirectly by pressing on the pain side of the balance. So interesting. And so psychologically, now we're saying, if I give up sugar, and again, I'm just using sugar, everybody use your drug of choice. If I, if I give up sugar, I have to remind myself of two things. One is that eventually other things, I will increase my pleasure of all these other foods. So I'm not just giving up a pleasure forever. I'm actually sort of increasing my pleasure. I'm just not um, muting the pleasure of everything else. And then the second thing is the um, even the pain of withdrawal itself, but pain, um, and when I feel that pain, it's it's going to be giving me more pleasure, even just maybe even the dopamine that shows up. And I wonder if this is dopamine when I was like, wow, that was a good day. I feel pretty good about today. Like whether that's, you know, like a, a, a thought, but that thought is catalyzed by, you know, some increases in my dopamine levels. And oh, I've for sure. For sure. So I had this great email from a reader who's trying to quit smoking. And he said, now, when I, whenever I feel craving for a cigarette, I just imagine these little gremlins hopping up and down on the pain side of my balance. I'm like, okay, I can just wait them out. They'll hop right. off. It'll go. And yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, um, I have another person that I'm working with who now has a whole new morning routine where he gets up, he meditates, he exercises, um, he does all these things that are effortful and to some degree uncomfortable. But, you know, by the time he starts his day, he's like, I feel good. I feel ready for the day. So mm -hmm. yes, essentially what we're doing is inviting discomfort into our lives for the purpose of resetting our reward pathways so that in the long run, things will be more enjoyable, more satisfying, 
That's great. I love it. And and for those of you who, again, who are listening and who who know my work, I, there's a book I wrote called Leading with Emotional Courage. And it's the mm. willingness to feel things. And if you expand your capacity to feel, you expand your capacity to act. And what you're saying is, if you expand your capacity to feel this discomfort, you actually expand your capacity for pleasure. Because yes. you're, you know, you're, you're going to these areas you would otherwise avoid going to. And that's actually increasing your dopamine. Yeah, that was beautifully said. And I just want to say it's also incredibly counterculture, that message, because we're being told at every turn that we should take a pill or do something or buy something in order to be more Feel comfortable. Good. Right, 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 right. And ultimately, yeah. And ultimately that, that contributes to our being, you know, more, more unhappy. Right. So you say these two things I'm going to put together, which you talk about radical honesty mm -hmm. as really important in terms of promoting awareness, intimacy, um, you know, a, a, a sense of plenty um, and also uh, pro-social shame. Yeah. And so I'm curious for you to talk about that. And also I have a question in there, which is if it's pro-social, is it shame? Mm. Um, you know, mm -hmm. or does the fact that it's pro-social just make it connected, but no longer shame. So anyway, I, I would love to hear you talk about both of those things and it's their importance in this task we have of, of, of kind of overcoming or, or, uh, dancing more effectively with this dopamine pain balance. Yes. So one of the things I've learned from my patients over the years who are in good recovery from severe addictions is that they have to tell the truth about everything, not just about substance use, but about why they were late for a meeting. And if they start to engage in lying, they're very likely to relapse. So I got really curious about that. You know, why is it that truth telling um, is so important to our ability to manage this reflexive pleasure pain balance? And I talk about a number of different factors, but just to cover a few, um, one of them is that, you know, when we are truthfully narrating how we're spending our time and what we're, what we're doing, we're essentially reconnecting neural pathways between our pleasure pain balance and our prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is that very large gray matter area that's fundamental to delayed gratification, uh, storytelling, being able to anticipate future consequences. And one of the things that probably happens in addiction is that those two parts of the brain start stop talking to each other. So radical honesty is a way to reinforce and reconnect those parts of the brain so that we can actually be aware of what we're doing because we've told somebody else that we're doing it. The other thing is that there are data suggesting that if you take a like a trans, transcranial magnetic stimulator and you put it on the prefrontal cortex, people are less likely to lie during a, um, a die rolling task. So the, the, the inverse is probably also true, which is that active engagement in telling the truth, which is effortful, by the way, because we're all, we all tell lies, but we all tell an average truth. And it's also painful. Yeah. And it's painful because you have to suffer right? the immediate consequences. Because you have to meet, suffer the immediate consequences of telling maybe an unseemly truth. That's right. And it's, and it's shameful, right? You have to have the, ex, you know, be able to absorb that moment of shame when you sort of, you know, disclose. But by doing that, we're probably strengthening prefrontal cortical circuitry, which again is so fundamental to our capacity to regulate that pleasure pain pathway. Also, we all want to be seen for who we truly are and to be loved and accepted for that. And so radically being honest, especially with those, you know, in those relationships that are primary for us is really fundamental to fostering intimacy. We always talk about connectedness, but we don't often talk about how actually to do that. And radical truth telling is the way to do that, to be and, truly and, honest. And, and, the, and the shame and the pro-social shame piece is to say, to be willing to be seen fully, yes, hopefully in environments that can hold that as opposed that's right. to, yeah. Yeah, so that's the key with pro-social shame versus destructive shame. If we're in an environment where our truth telling leads to our being ridiculed or shunned, which is of course the great fear uh, that comes with the emotion of shame that will be cast out, um, then that will just perpetuate you know, our maladaptive uh, addictive behaviors. But if we're in an environment where telling the truth um, is actually a source of wonder and acceptance 
and we see a pathway for making amends or you know repairing the damage that we've done that's incredibly um, fostering of intimacy and also strengthens those group ties so to answer your question about shame pro-social shame i do believe that pro-social shame is still really shame. still yes a very painful emotion incredibly painful because it, it it's fessing up the ways in which we've been selfish um lied cheated, stole, whatever it was we did. Yeah. And the terror of that associates that will we be cast out? Because that's really what shame is all about. It, it, it's the way to get the group to align with whatever the normative um, rules are in the group. And if you digress enough, there's a fear, well, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be in the group anymore, which is terror, right? right? right. But, but when we're in an environment where we can be honest and experience the shame and make amends, it really strengthens the group. And it also probably releases a ton of dopamine because, you know, it's true intimacy building. Right. You know, a major, major lesson from all of this is, you know, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm oversimplifying, uh, is to stop trying so hard to avoid difficult things and to recognize that it's the difficult things in many ways that are responsible for releasing the dopamine, not the quick hits, but you know, the hard work that contains and, and think about like in our own life and all of our lives, like what are those things that um, are effortful to do? I think of writing as one of those things. It's very, very effortful to do and it gives me a lot of pleasure and it sort of explains why and that that pleasure is much more uh, longer lasting than, than you know, the pleasure of a uh, Klondike bar. Or whatever. I don't know. I haven't had one of those in a really long time. Yeah. I don't know why that popped in my head. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think you're you're absolutely right. I agree 100%. And I would say even what I find fascinating is just in my own mind, how much even in my own ruminations, I want to escape them. So it's it's just we reflexively don't want to be in that space. But if we recognize that, and then just take a breath and turn toward those thoughts and say, okay, this is what it is. I'm, I am, this is, I am, I am experiencing sadness or despair or anger. It's amazing how that sort of takes the sting out of it. Mm. Anna Lemke, thank you so much. The book that she has written is Dopamine Nation. Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence. I so love this. I so love this conversation with you. I'm hoping that this is not the last time that we talk. I've yeah. learned a tremendous amount, both from the book and from you. Thank you so much for being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Oh my goodness. Thank you for having me. I feel like I talked too much, but you were great and it was a lot of fun. <laughs> no, you did not talk too much. You were awesome. You were awesome. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>